Right, and I'm glad that you are here. Um, we always begin, uh, many of you have heard me say this before, but we begin our public events with a little safety announcement. I'm your responsible safety officer. I'm in charge of all of you to make sure that you're going to be well and safe today if anything happens. Uh, please follow my directions. The exits are right here at that door, that door. The exit down to the ground level is in that corner. We'll go out through those doors. We're going to go across the street. We're going to meet under those great big beautiful trees and we'll have a picnic, okay? But please, if anything happens, follow me and we're all going to be safe. Uh, I'm very happy and very proud to be able to welcome uh, uh, the minister today. Uh, we don't often have a chance to have deputy prime ministers and defense ministers, but it's a real privilege. And I'm delighted to have uh, Minister Shimonyak with us. Um, I'm a very sentimental person. And uh, we Americans uh, should be eternally grateful to Poland for having given us generals that got us in shape for the Revolutionary War. We would have lost the Revolutionary War had it not been for a couple of Polish generals who came over here and said, we can help train this band. You know, the first year was pretty ragged. We hardly survived the first year of the Revolutionary War, and it hadn't been for uh, General Pulaski, we wouldn't have survived. So we just have an eternal debt of gratitude to Poland and what uh, Poland has done for us. Um, I think it's an important setting to say we've relied on this very important ally for many things through the years, and I think more now than ever. I think that uh, we're facing a challenge, a security challenge, in Europe that's as large in my personal experience that we've had in the last 20 years. And we have a lot of questions. We have a lot of uncertainty. We have a... Uh, NATO is has not been the focus of attention for 20 years. One country has kept it at the top of its thinking. That's Poland. Poland has consistently held that its uh, primary responsibility was to be at the heart of this alliance. And it has been a champion for it. And now we turn to Poland to be able to help us think through the challenges of the day that we're in. So I think it's unusually important for us and valuable for us to have the leader of the defense establishment and the vice prime minister here to talk with us this afternoon about the security challenges that we're facing in Europe and the leadership we're counting on from our best ally, Poland, that's going to help us think that through and work together with them. So could I ask all of you, with your applause, to please welcome the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense, uh, His Honorable Excellency Tomasz Szymoniak. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that within the next hour, you will not have to follow the guidance uh, of your uh, boss where the exit is from this room, because the subjects at hand are very important and serious. I really enjoy uh, that you have come here in such a big crowd, and I hope that the upcoming hour and a half will match the expectation that was presented uh, in the introduction. And they will also be in line with the situation. People in Poland, in the United States, and uh, globally are interested in, because people are interested in security. They ask security-related questions. In Poland, they ask with concern whether Poland and Europe continue to be safe and secure and whether or not the demons of history have perhaps returned. And those demons that made us start everything from the scratch every two generations. So moving on to the subject of my uh, address, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the questions of security in my country have become 
definitely our priority. They are in the very heart of the public debate. But before I move on to the security situation, I would like to thank very much for the invitation to come to the center, to John Hamm and, to, and Ms. Conley for their idea to have this meeting. I also would like to thank for a, a long-term cooperation with Poland. I also uh, thank uh, for the American for being an American pillar of the Warsaw uh, Defense Dialogue, and that was one of the reasons for which we could have had a chance to meet. And during this meeting, you will get a first report from those meetings. I want to thank for that too, because that was an initiative of my deputy, who used to be our ambassador to Washington, Mr. Robert Kupiecki. I value that uh, very much, uh, all these meetings that took place uh, in the frameworks of the dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, after Poland joined NATO, we focused on the development and modernization of our armed forces, and we considered it to be our tangible contribution to the alliance. For example, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, by the means of the Act of Law, we defined that the defense budget uh, should be 1.95% of GDP. We also made efforts to keep a strong dimension of collective defense within NATO. We stressed the significance of the transatlantic bond, building our partnership with the United States. It was about the acquisition of F-16, the military contribution in our uh, combined operations in Iraq and then in Afghanistan. We supported the practical initiatives for the development of European defense capabilities. For example, Weimar Triangle with Poland, uh, France, and um, Germany. We organized the defense cooperation regionally, like Visegrad Group, Baltic States, or support for Ukraine. We have been doing this in this um, continuous uh, uh, conviction that defense really and always matters. Today, all those directions of Polish defense uh, policy continue to be relevant, and, and they do not have to be changed. The radical change of the security environment in Europe, however, indicates the necessity to strengthen the whole Euro-Atlantic political and military cooperation infrastructure. And I believe that this is the main Polish defense priority today. The point of departure must be an identification of the situation together and coming to a conclusion that the worsening of the security situation in particular along the eastern front line of the alliance is of a permanent nature. As Karl Bildt recently said here, Europe is not surrounded today by the uh, ring of friends, by the, but by the ring of fire. Poland has no doubt that the events of recent months uh, indicate and prove without doubt that we are having to do with the change of the climate and not a summer storm only. We hope that it will be fully understood also by our allies. The solution of the problem takes us through policy, politics and diplomacy that is free from illusions, which must not be naive or hypocritical. But uh, against the background of it, there must be the military measures deterrence. The Russian aggression against Ukraine and the contempt for the rules of the international law demonstrated by that has a permanent destabilizing influence on the entirety of the European security architecture because it is not about the kinetic measures that are taken by Russia. The essence of the problem is a combined its aggressive military doctrine that assumes the use of force the growing combat capabilities and their practical man manifestation in terms of regular offensive exercises as well as concentration of significant forces along the borders of NATO. It is accompanied by the whole range of aggressive instruments which are called compound warfare. Another more complicated are those uh, challenges for uh, European security. They come from the South. They are equally important, and they also require our common response. However, we have to stress that uh, outside of the military dimension, the challenges that we are having to do in the southern dimension, southern neighborhood of Europe, are of an economic, cultural, or even civilizational background. The response uh, to, chat, uh, to threats coming out of uh, that must cover a much uh, broader span of actions, uh, and military instruments are only one of the measures, and I believe not most important. It is important to understand this difference in order to avoid the false dilemma, east or south. 
which uh, could very negatively influence the debate on the directions for the development of NATO. In Poland, we do not accept this division. However, we see the necessity of sound and strategic conduct in both directions. Ladies and gentlemen, the current strategic situation is a test for transatlantic relations. For over 25 years that have passed since the end of the Cold War, the significance of the transatlantic bond and its military visibility have never been so important as they are today. The basis of this bond has been and uh, will be the real engagement of the United States. The European security and uh, the solidarity and determination of allies in order not to allow others to divide us uh, in the name of the particular and ad hoc benefits. In recent decades, American infrastructure and military presence in the Mediterranean, in the south and west of Europe, have been an important factor that allows NATO to get involved in operations of crisis response in the Balkans, in Afghanistan, and in Libya. The American presence there is still important. It's a very important component of our activities along the south um, border of the alliance where Poland is ready to participate actively. However, the shift in the security situation uh, makes uh, uh, the uh, permanent rotational presence of uh, allied troops, in particular American troops along the eastern of, uh, border of NATO, uh, has become uh, also very important, and it requires the revision of many post-Cold War dogmas that create the military policy of NATO. Uh, and uh, in the current situation, they are not justified. That is why it is important uh, uh, to know the European Reassurance Initiative that uh, enforces uh, the uh, reassurance measures um, along the eastern of front line of the alliance. We believe that they will have a, they will have a permanent and not only temporary nature because the stable and long-term prospect of military presence is very important uh, for assurance, but also deterrence. And that is why what General Breedlove said prior to the Wales summit is that the strengthening of the eastern uh, front line of NATO must be a new normal in the alliance activities. So the challenge to this uh, extent is the execution of the concept uh, of the establishment of the uh, storages and military equipment uh, pre uh, positioned here. Realizing this, we will be trying to get as much synergy between the measures of NATO as the alliance and our strategic partnership with NATO. The result of uh, this bilateral cooperation is uh, very good now, but it is not exhausted. For over a year, American troops have been uh, training in Polish uh, training ranges. Uh, our air forces have been uh, cooperating on the basis of the American Aviation Detachment in Poland. We are starting to develop the base of the uh, missile defense system in Radzikowo in Poland, so these forms of cooperation can be ex extended to cover also other allies of our region. Uh, and uh, it is uh, better to bring into the system also the Visegrad Group and the Baltic States. New capabilities in this context will also be opened up by the acquisition of Patriot systems by Poland. And we have just started intergovernmental consultations uh, about that. We are thinking in realistic terms about partnership with the United States. We do not expect the Sixth Fleet to be deployed to the Baltic Sea. We know that it is to be in the Mediterranean. However, we believe that Poland can be a hub for American military activity in the region. The aviation detachment I mentioned uh, can be a basis for the broader cooperation of Air Force uh, in Central Europe. The location uh, of uh, the uh, military equipment, the prepositioning of that could serve the purpose of American ac military activity along the eastern flank uh, front line of the alliance. And uh, the multinational core in Szczecin is very important to this extent, and its core uh, headquarters together with EUCOM can get more uh, involved in the planning and coordination of uh, uh, combined exercises and trainings. The American presence is only one of the measures of the transatlantic equation. Another, which is also important, is Europe and European, intru European uh, contribution to our um, defense effort. We have been debating this for years. In December 2013, heads of state and government of the European Union, in the first uh, statement of their declaration, they wrote, defense matters. And I believe that it is the shortest sentence in European documents. After a year and a half since that meeting, this statement is only a political slogan without any real activities.
Poland is uh, still one of uh, quite a numerous group of European allies uh, that uh, fulfill uh, the uh, commitments of investment in defense, according to Defense Investment Pledge from Wales. Our defense budgets will go um, above the level of 2% GDP this year, according to the legislation. Uh, from next year on, 2% uh, defense budget as a measure of GDP will be guaranteed. We are investing in new helicopters, missile and air defense system, modern artillery, mobility of our army and modernization of Navy, uh, the communication and command systems. Pretty soon in the planning perspective, uh, which is 2022, Poland uh, will have spent over $40 billion on modernization. And that means that we are spending today to defend us more uh, than all other countries that joined NATO after 1999 together. We encourage our European partners to make similar effort. What concerns us in particular uh, is uh, preparing a number of European uh, armies mainly to perform expeditionary operations of um, crisis response uh, uh, profile. What has been neglected uh, is uh, more requiring combat capabilities, high-end combat capabilities. So cooperation within the European Union should focus on uh, the uh, seeking of practical measures uh, that can uh, reduce European deficit in defense capabilities. The pragmatic solutions cannot be replaced by ambitious but also abstract discussions about the European army. It is true, in the early 50s, uh, Western Europe was only one step from the execution of this vision. However, a few, only a few, uh, only few people remember today that the then uh, Joint European Army was uh, prepared by shape officers. Uh, it was to be under full control and command of Sakur, that was General Eisenhower and his successors. Sixty years uh, later, NATO continues to be the key to the European security. However, NATO must adjust to the change of the uh, security situation that we are having to do with today. It does not need the revolution, but what is necessary is the strategic adaptation. The readiness action plan that was adopted in Wales is the beginning of the process. The priority is the practical execution of key elements of RAP. It is mainly uh, focused on three factors, full implementation of the reform of NATO response force, including the achievement of the operational readiness by the VJTF, by the summit in Warsaw, the so-called spearhead. Poland has taken over the duty to become one of the framework nations for uh, VJTF, and we are ready to host them and exercise in Poland. And the first exercise will happen this June. The adjustments to the new requirements of command structure uh, in Poland and in other uh, five countries uh, of Eastern Frontline, uh, the command elements are being established, uh, so-called nephews, that are to facilitate the movement of uh, VJTF and support the planning and exercises of Article 5. But it's also important uh, to note the role of the core in stretching that, is, um, that was created by Poland, Germany, and Denmark. We are increasing its readiness, preparing uh, to taking up new tasks uh, and increasing internationalization. Uh, the headquarters in Szczecin is to take a command role for the NRF force uh, if they are going to be deployed in the front, um, in the Eastern front line. Next thing is uh, the strengthening of advanced planning of NATO in the frameworks of the collective defense. It is one of the key questions for the practical execution of Article 5 uh, uh, guarantees, including the threats of a compound or hybrid nature. Uh, the detailed uh, planning solutions for the uh, border countries of NATO is necessary to talk about the actual increasing of our crisis response capabilities. We are based on experience from the implementation of readiness action plan, so we want the next year's summit in Warsaw to initiate the next stage of strategic adaptation of NATO. It should strengthen uh, the capabilities and measures uh, and assets of the alliance, not only those units that are needed for the immediate reaction. It is necessary to change the profile of NATO first structure, which will uh, give the alliance the possibility to respond not only with the brigade, but also with the division and core. It is necessary to stress more heavy capabilities and that increase the credibility of conventional deterrence. It is also seems that it is necessary to increase NATO uh, common funding for the development of uh, defense infrastructure that allows uh, the reception of uh, the reinforcement forces, especially in the East. 
we called these proposals the Orso Initiative of Strategic Adaptation, and we are going to talk about it with our allies pretty soon. And we are counting on the support uh, lended to us by the United States. I believe that an important contribution to the discussion can be made by the Orso Defense Dialogue. I talked about it a moment ago, and I hope uh, that you will continue to express interest in this project. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I also would like to tell you that this morning I had a possibility to meet Secretary of Defense Ash Carter to talk about all these uh, subjects I'm presenting to you in the frameworks of our broad agenda of Polish-American military cooperation. I thanked uh, Secretary Carter on behalf of Polish authorities and Polish uh, people uh, for all the measures and activities the United States has taken up for over a year to demonstrate the strength of NATO and to demonstrate the, its engagement also in Poland, but not only in Poland, it concerns also other allies. We are convinced that this engagement is one of fundamental guarantees of our security. When I talked to Secretary Carter today, I asked for increasing uh, the uh, intensity of this uh, cooperation, more American presence in Poland, and at the same time, I declared increased and continuous Polish effort, including financial effort, in strengthening of our alliance. And I believe that our common thinking, our shared responsibility, is the best response to all the crises, uh, whichever the direction. I am going to leave Washington reassured that we are thinking uh, in very similar terms about the situation and there is a great possibility for us to work together within the upcoming months and years. Thank you very much. Minister, thank you so much for those wonderful comments. I'll let you get your device on. Welcome. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at CSIS for uh, Europe and Eurasia. And I have to say uh, not only a warm thank you to the minister, but to all of my colleagues from the Ministry of Defense. In December of last year, CSIS and the Polish Defense Ministry embarked on a new transatlantic security initiative called the Warsaw Defense Dialogue. Uh, U.S. Uh, oop, we're going to change yeah. your things. <laughs> Perfect. Um, we came together, U.S. Uh, security experts, Polish experts, to have a quiet conversation about the changed European security environment and what we needed to do. I have to tell you personally, it was one of the most invigorating and intellectually rich discussions that I participated in. The minister took time out of his busy schedule to speak to us, and it began a series of conversations. Out front, you, I please take a copy of some of the ideas and the conversations that took place in that dialogue. It's, it's really a, a wealth of information, so that's my uh, little uh, advertisement, but we, we encourage you to do that. M Mr. Minister, um, I have so many questions for you. I'm going to hold back and only ask you a few and then let our audience uh, ask you some important questions. But I, you've just made a little news. You've told us about the Warsaw Initiative for Strategic Adaptation. This would be a very bold new plan for NATO during next year's NATO summit in Warsaw. If I understood you correctly, though, this would probably require a change or perhaps the end to the NATO-Russia Founding Act, something that was created in 1997 for a very different purpose. Are you suggesting perhaps that NATO must put aside the NATO-Russia Founding Act? You promised simple questions. And this question 
would be sufficient to publish a thicker book than uh, the record of your work. But I will try to respond briefly. I remember perfectly well that moment two years ago when the British were preparing the NATO summit in Newport, Newport, and they were thinking what the purpose of that summit was supposed to be. What kind of NATO uh, are we going to have after Afghanistan, NATO post-Afghanistan? However, life, life brought answers to these questions. So the fact that we decided to become hosts of NATO summit in 2016 results from our very deep conviction that it is necessary to have a new alliance. It is necessary for the alliance to go through the process of strategic adaptation. And since Warsaw is a venue of NATO summit, it is really worthwhile naming this initiative, a Warsaw initiative. Well, perhaps you know it, or perhaps you don't know it, by the meeting of uh, uh, NATO's uh, heads of state and government, or at least their dinner, is planned in exactly the same room where in 1955, six years ago, the Warsaw Pact was signed. And that is going to be of a great symbolic character. So I believe that both the name and this initiative can totally defend themselves. How can we co connect it with the NATO's uh, uh, NATO Russia Funding Act. We talked about it a lot before Newport. And we decided to look at it pragmatically. Actually, that the alliance must not be limited in its uh, measures that concern the security of its allies. And that we assess that it was Russia that violated first the provisions of the Founding Act. I think that the caution expressed by some European allies is excessive. Because even if we take this act into account, then the measures, the activities taken up by uh, NATO and the United States in uh, crisis response do not go beyond that act. But definitely, NATO-Russia relations will be in the focus of our attention within the upcoming months. Today, there was a meeting. Uh, of Secretary General Stoltenberg with the uh, Russian Foreign Minister after quite a long pause, I have to admit. And I am sure that uh, uh, our, uh, uh, well, we will have to talk about that. We will be discussing this subject in the coming weeks. I am sure that it is also going to be an important part of the context of the next year's summit in Warsaw. Minister, have you been pleased with the exercising what you've been seeing as NATO's putting together uh, the spearhead force, the multiple exercises that have taken place over the last several months. Is there anything that concerns you about how NATO is uh, building forward its, its deployable forces and its exercises? What is, has anything surprised you as you've watched and been very engaged with these NATO exercises? Another difficult question, I guess. Because my uh, official response should be very optimistic. But I guess that this year has tested uh, us very much in terms of our attitude to exercises. It's in NATO and other NATO states. It is difficult to resist an impression that before everything happened, uh, very much attention was focused, uh, focused on VIP days uh, for the visits of all those distinguished visitors. And that was the culmination of exercises. But today, we are fighting VIP days actively fighting them in order to avoid an impression that the exercises serve the only purpose of satisfying officials or mass media, satisfied and fed with picture. Uh, when American uh, Patriot batteries uh, were exercising uh, of Warsaw, together with my, um, my friend, Ambassador of the United States, Stephen Mull, we went there to Sukhachev, and then we uh, told them, uh, don't put all those batteries behind us uh, with the rows of troops there. We were in the field, and the exercises were far, far in the field in order to uh, demonstrate that we do not, we are not doing that for the picture, but that those exercises were for 
they, they were for fact. And to tell you the truth, it really means a very brutal verification of what really works, what is really prepared. But this is the only way now. Russia, as I uh, said, Russia has been exercising for years. Practically, they have also been testing whether the army uh, is able to leave barracks within a couple of hours or whether all those indicators are fake. I guess what we started a year ago will give very good tangible outcomes. Uh, the noble job exercise in June, I mentioned that it's the first VJTF exercise. We plan that exercise to show really what works and what does not work. Oh, I'm afraid I may ask another difficult question. Sorry. Uh, Poland has been embarking on a very impressive military modernization program. In fact, you've just very recently announced some very, uh, very significant uh, weapons purchases from missile defense to attack helicopters and now embarking on a, a more in, uh, modernization of your maritime, uh, the Navy, the submarine effort. Are you pleased with the pace of this progress? Would you, what would you do differently if you could do something differently right now as you looked at how you've approached military modernization? and uh, help us understand some of your thinking about what the future modernization picture looks like. You've been a model for other NATO members. We welcome your insights on your own program. The modernization of the Polish armed forces after the collapse of communism started uh, 15 years ago. In, uh, 2000, 2001, that was the decision concerning the acquisition of the multi-role fighter, F-16. At that time, we accepted that the priority for, for us was a significant transformation of our Air Force. And what followed from that was the decision to buy F-16 uh, and new uh, transportation aircraft, the airlift aircraft. That priority was well done, and it absorbed significant funds. You were asking about the Navy. It is one of the most neglected services in our conditions. There are different reasons for that. Some of those reasons are that for years, people believed that Poland did not need a more uh, powerful Navy, that the Baltic Sea was a small sea, and that we actually have to focus on the commitment on NATO commitments. Uh, like seconding one ship, perhaps, and we don't have a significant force in the Baltic Sea. But we changed that approach. And we believe that Poland should have a state-of-the-art navy, and there has been uh, a plan adopted for the development of the Polish navy up to 2030 that covers submarines, the coastal defense uh, uh, ships, uh, patrol ships, and mine destroyers. And with great satisfaction, I can tell you that after years of both, in the upcoming months, we are going to uh, present two new ships uh, to our navy. Have the recent events influenced the shift in our priorities? Yes. They have. We decided that we have to speed up our helicopter program, and that why, uh, that is why there was a decision that we uh, were going to buy uh, the attack helicopters faster. We also have introduced some adjustments in our ideas that are connected with the cyber threats, communication systems, individual soldiers' equipment, and we decided that we could not postpone the execution of these programs. So as much as uh, our budget allows us, we are trying not to waste more time. Um, Mr. Minister, I asked you to look at the strengths and weaknesses of NATO's exercises. I'd like your reflections on and your observations of Russia's military exercises. We've seen a lot of activity in the maritime component and the Baltic Sea as well uh, is in uh, multiple, multiple exercises showing us complexity. What have been some of your observations of the Russian military exercise in the region? Russian exercises have been very intensive in recent months. 
and uh, they uh, have been organized without any notice. Uh, there are some limitations imposed by the international law. However, good relations should also uh, be connected with warning or notice uh, to other nations about your plans. These exercises are organized quite often in uh, such a way that is quite well widespread in the media, so it is no secret that it is of a provocative nature. For example, they use aircraft to test different systems, uh, flying very close to the borders or flying in such a way that it can pose a threat to civilian aviation. So definitely, the exercises of the Russian armed forces are, on the one hand, very practical. They test their systems, but on the other hand, we see an element of exerting political pressure in them. And the Baltic Sea has become a place where the pressure is quite visible. For hundreds of years, Russia has believed uh, uh, a strategic space for Russia. If you uh, look back in history, you can see that in terms of Western neighbors of Russia, Russia has uh, waged wars against Poland, Sweden. So those areas, this space traditionally has been uh, very much of uh, Russia's interest. So we are watching the Baltic Sea very attentively, and we do encourage the United States to see the Baltic Sea as a very important space. When you look at, at a big map of the world, uh, uh, when you look at it from uh, Washington, uh, you see that it's a small sea, and it's surrounded by allies mainly. But from the geopolitical perspective, from the perspective of Europe, the Baltic Sea is of, a, is of a great significance. A few months ago, Polish Prime Minister Eva Kopacz spoke with President of the United States, Barack Obama, on the phone. She talk, they, they talked about different things, and uh, President Obama congratulated her on taking over the position. But she noted uh, one thing with President Obama, the Baltic Sea, that the United States looked at the Baltic Sea. So it's quite an important indication. And it is important. It's very good that we are talking about it. It's good that the United States uh, can see the Baltic states. Uh, Sweden and Finland are also uh, in your American agenda. My last question, I'm just a warm up because our audience is going to ask even more difficult questions. Um, I have been reading some articles that uh, there's been a, a volunteer movement uh, to, to get some military training. Members of the po of Polish parliament, uh, uh, other uh, young people are, are being encouraged to, uh, to join some exercises. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? True. Recently, we have observed the increased interest of training of reserve troops and defense organizations. A few days ago, there was a one-day-long training of members of parliament. It was actually to serve a purpose of a role model. Um, uh, uh, and not a practical exercise, I believe. And it is a demonstration of what I referred to at the beginning of my address, that people of Poland, our citizens, they feel that security is important, that security does matter, also individually, personally. For six years, uh, we haven't uh, uh, had any conscript army anymore uh, because our army is now professional and in practice for the last 20 years. Uh, quite many young people haven't served in the armed forces because they uh, went to university. Uh, so these people now, they want to have some skills. Sometimes when I uh, talk with my well, vouchers, and then I hear that, for example, a wife gave her husband a gift for his 40th birthday, a shooting course, for example. So it's not only about hobby. It's also about people being very serious about security and about their capabilities. I look at it positively. We are also 
only trying to make it in such a way so that it was beneficial both for these people but also for the security system because we have to see the difference between all those hobbies, amateurs who want to have a nice time in the firing range uh, from those who want to do something for the country and for themselves. All right. Well, I hope I've given you some time to think of your questions. Thank you. Um, we have microphones. Um, if you could uh, give us your name, your affiliation, particularly because we have translation. If you could keep the question very concise and the comments short, I know our translator would be grateful. So I think we're going to start down here in the middle. Sir, in the back, there's a microphone coming your way. Okay, am I on here? Yeah. Mr. Minister, thank you for your appearance and for your, for your comments. Uh, my name is Dan Abahazi. Uh, I work in the Department of Defense on the Joint Staff, and I'm in the training and exercise business. So um, you took a decision recently to move Anaconda from September to June, your national exercise next year, I believe, to coincide with the Warsaw Summit. Can you uh, tell us what your expectations are for Anaconda and what the potential is for it to send a clear message uh, to the Allies to assure them and uh, to uh, our friends in the East? Thank you. This message is simple. And that is also connected with what I'm talking about here. Our will that key uh, decisions from Newport will have been implemented by a NATO summit in Warsaw. Not having them on paper, not us announcing that they have been implemented, but we simply want to show in practice that they work. And that all these structures and all these elements we talked about in Newport, uh, that they are really implemented. And that, wa that is why we make that, des that decision anaconda is a traditional name of our Polish exercises that take place every uh, second year, quite often with the participation of our allies, including those from the United States. We are ready to do a lot. And this exercise is also going to be about our national effort. Using this uh, opportunity of having you here, sir, I would like to ask you uh, to, to act in your work for that cause that this exercise is really you know, visible for those who are supposed to see them and not only our guests for the VIP day, then I will be very much committed to you for that, sir. Message received. <laughs> Thank you. I think we'll stay in just in this section here. We have one and two questions. Here we go. Microphone here, sir, right here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, <coughs> Arwan Lagadek from uh, George Washington University. We've talked a lot about Na the NATO side, uh, but you briefly mentioned the European Union side uh, of defense um, in your comments. A couple of questions. I mean, the first one is in terms of European Union dipl diplomacy. When we look back at how uh, Radek Sikorsky used to be very uh, visible uh, and forceful in, in the early days of the Ukraine crisis, um, I just would like to have your comments on the Normandy format. Uh, which now only includes the French, the Germans, the Ukrainians, and, and the Russians. Do, 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 are you satisfied with, with that format, or, or do you feel that uh, we'll be better off with, uh, with more of an Eastern European voice? Um, and second, uh, we are headed to a, a European Union, uh, a rare European Union summit uh, on defense in, in June. Uh, and you mentioned the, what got us there, which is the December 2013 summit. Uh, in a nutshell, what is a successful outcome for that, from that summit in, in your mind? Thanks. So a question on the diplomacy of the Normandy format, your view on that, and then any predictions for the June European Council uh, meeting on European defense? Thank you for noticing the role of our former foreign minister, Radek Sikorski. Uh, the activity of uh, these three foreign ministers definitely influenced the situation in Kiev February last year. As far as the Normandy format is concerned, in Poland we are quite distanced from that project because we believe that, you know, it's not just about Poland. But it is much better uh, whenever the United States is involved and uh, the European Union as such is involved. But we definitely support the Minsk process. 
and the Minsk Protocol and the personal courage, bravery of Chancellor Merkel, who put very much uh, uh, on the table. And she deserves very much respect because we knew that it would be terribly difficult to go to Minsk, Alexander Lukashenko, and in that situation meet Vladimir Putin. I guess that uh, uh, the uh, recent uh, activity of the United States, which is not involved in the Normandy format, uh, but you know, uh, the engagement of uh, Secretary Kerry uh, and uh, Ms. Nuland in Kiev, Sochi, Moscow, they open up a new stage. We do not know uh, about that stage, what it is going to be like, but let's hope that the engagement of the United States serves the purpose of you know, pushing, the, or pushing things forward. Because if you follow the uh, evaluation of the Minsk agreement in uh, Germany or the position on Russia uh, in Germany, you can see how very much people are disappointed that Russia is not keeping its word uh, to speak quite uh, lightly. Talking about the European Council on Common European Security and Defense Policy, we are looking forward to having practical decisions. Our expectations are not really overinflated. Many good documents uh, have been drafted in the past. So what we want is the opening of the development of the new European security strategy. Uh, the last, uh, the current strategy was drafted in 2003, and it is from a different epoch, the epoch when we were not even a member of the European Union. Secondly, we want decisions to be made that instruments uh, that uh, were uh, created a long time ago, and they even cost money, like the European battle groups or the European defense agency, so that they started to be operational, working, giving outcomes without any illusion that it is going to be an equal form of some institution to NATO. No, because this is not the point. But we believe that in different European measures, we can do a lot. But at the end of the day, it is about individual national capabilities. If we are engaged in some European projects, for example, the uh, to a tanker, they will serve NATO, not only us in the European Union. Uh, so our Polish prime minister is going to go to that council with a strong expectation to have tangible outcomes from that council. We have had a number of declarations up to date, but tangible things must be finally done. It's not going to be great. Uh, for example, the European Union used to have 1,000 troops that are able to deploy any place in the world, any time. That would be sufficient. I think we have one. Steve Larrabee, a question right there, and then I promise I'll move over to this section. Uh, Mr. Minister, Steve Larrabee, Rand Corporation, one second. Uh, there have been repeated reports over the years, and particularly in the last month, that uh, Russia has moved uh, Iskander missiles, which have a range which could reach Mos Moscow, into the district by Kaliningrad. Could you enlighten us about that? And secondly, whether they've also moved backfire uh, back, which are nuclear capable, back uh, into uh, Crimea. What's the reason for this or the official rationale, and what is uh, Poland's position on this? Just to make sure everyone understood that, the movement of a Skander missiles uh, potentially within range uh, of Poland, whether that's Crimea, Kaliningrad. Thank you. Iskander. In Poland, it's like the Loch Ness monster. It pops up from time to time. That Russia has deployed, is deploying, or will deploy as counter to Kaliningrad Oblast. So we are a little immune to the nervousness or anxiety about it. I don't think that it should be treated as as something isolated for, from a broader context. You can deploy Iskander any time, and you can redeploy them any time, any place. I'm sure it is strong in propaganda, a political thing, Iskanders. Let me note that this Loch Ness monster popped up uh, when the missile defense talks were pending as a reaction to the installation of missile defense in Poland. 
So surely it is not something uh, against Poland, but against NATO, especially that the rangers cover at least the territory of Germany. Uh, so this is the problem of the whole alliance. Uh, I and we in Poland see a lot of game playing about it. Because any Russian commentator, whenever they say anything about his countries, then Polish mass media, well, it is immediately uh, the headlines. Your second question. It's also, you know, there's very much propaganda in it and demonstration how permanent this link is going to be between Russia and Crimea. It is about a number of different ideas, undertakings Russia is uh, involved in in Crimea. I just read that when in the hockey game where President Putin played, the best player was Russian Defense Minister Shoigu. And as a reward, he was given uh, the vacation in Crimea. So, you know, nuclear warheads or Minister Shoigu, whatever. These are elements to show that Crimea is Russian. And it's about, you know, irritating public opinion, definitely in Ukraine, but also in other countries. I'm feeling a lot of tweets are going out that esconders are like Loch Ness monsters. So I, I can already feel the, the, uh, the message going. We'll take a colleague right there, please, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you. Brad Harris with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Uh, a few months ago, two senior members of the U.S. Congress wrote a letter to the U.S. administration saying that we should consider deploying U.S. B-61 nuclear bombs to the Baltic states and Poland. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on this and comment on um, what, how Poland views nuclear weapons in your defense posture. Thank you. For the nuclear weapons, it has always been part of uh, NATO discussions. I remember a discussion a few years ago when ministers uh, of defense from Eastern Europe convinced some of our Western colleagues that it was not worthwhile giving up that option and that nuclear weapons will continue to be a key element for deterrence uh, uh, in years ahead, as it has been the case uh, for dozens and dozens of years. So, um, in recent period, in connection with the activities taken by Russia with its nuclear potential, we also approached this differently in NATO. Uh, the discussion in NATO at the February ministerial was a little bit different. It was not routine anymore, but it was political. I do not want to talk about details. Uh, responding to the question of that letter of uh, the representatives of the Congress, because it is not that we have the nuclear weapons. But I trust uh, that uh, the states, uh, in particular the United States, that in NATO have uh, nuclear weapons, uh, follow very attentively what the Russians are doing uh, and whether or not it fits in the limitations of the treaty uh, or whether or not it shifts uh, uh, the situation strategically. Certainly, it is not the case that uh, the nuclear weapon is something that can be put in the closet. No, it's just the other way around. Question right there. Sorry, coming around. Thank you. Uh, John Tropp, Post Eagle. Oh, uh, oh, turn it, turn it around. There you go. Uh, John Tropp. My name is John Trupp, the Post Eagle Weekly online newspaper, reports news of special interest to Polish Americans. My question goes to civilian control over Polish defense spending. Recently, the Polish opposition press reported that the parliamentary committee that, that re routinely reviews contracts and expenditures did not look at the contract to purchase helicopters from France that Poland bought that are twice as expensive as comparable helicopters produced by Boeing. Um, the question is, is that true? Are those Polish opposition press reports true that the Polish Parliamentary Committee never looked at the contract to buy helicopters from France? Uh, I think that my questions are difficult. 
pyta... You are asking a politician from a ruling coalition <laughs> says semi-jokingly, I will tell you it is difficult for me to say that the opposition press is writing the truth. But in this case, it is not true. Because the parliamentary committee on our initiative uh, has dealt with all the questions and all the contracts. The Polish law does not give any competencies to the parliamentary committee on that. It's different to Germany, where the, uh, in Germany the parliamentary committee has to express its consent or, or something. But it's, it's just like that. We informed the committee about the process. If you po follow Polish affairs, you know that it is now uh, the, uh, you know, the peak of the election campaign in our country, and all these questions are highly emotional. It's a very transparent, competitive process, and three builders. Decisions haven't been made yet. It's simply a decision for one of those proposals, one of the bills to be moved on to the next stage. And I believe that when the emotions of the election campaign go down, it will be uh, evaluated differently. Uh, as a uh, uh, proof uh, that what I'm saying is true, I can say that the uh, chairman of the Senate uh, Defense Committee in Poland, who was acquainted together with the members of the committee with documents, facts, information, uh, recognized our documents and we found them convincing. And he's a representative of the opposition party. So if you wish, uh, via the embassy, I can give you more details about the process. Uh, the press is quite critical about the government in Poland, as, is, as it is the case in every democratic country, I believe. But uh, we have the not only opposition presentation, so the review of information, it's been very broad. We have a question over there. Please. Justin, <clears throat> excuse me, Justin Doubleday with Inside Defense. I uh, just wanted to ask about the Patriot purchase. Um, can you just? <laughs> considerations went into that decision and how much do Poland's plans align with the United States plans for its air and missile defense forces? Until the very end of the process, we talked with two governments and with two bidders, the government of the United States and the government of France. And we asked these governments uh, to present as comprehensive proposals on missile and air defense system as possible, something that would not cover only the system, which is the uh, military, technical, and financial factors, but also industrial and security, political uh, security factors. And after comprehensive analysis of these two proposals on the 21st of April, the government made a decision that we moved on to the stage of negotiations with the government of the United States which uh, uh, unequivocally uh, pointed out at one system, which is the Patriot system, supported by the United States government. Uh, today, we talked about it with Secretary Carter, initiating, in practical terms, political negotiations. Uh, and it's a very good basis, because the American proposals uh, proposal was drafted earlier, and it was submitted to us a few days ago. I also met with President Kennedy of Raytheon, uh, so in those double track negotiations within the upcoming months, we will be preparing uh, the language of contracts. Together with Secretary Carter, uh, we decided uh, that these subjects are so serious that they will require personal uh, watch uh, by him as Secretary of Defense and myself as Defense Minister. So I'm satisfied with the talks today. My objective was to show to Secretary Carter that for us uh, it is a strategic decision, a governmental decision. It is not just about the purchase of a system, uh, just as an uh, element of equipment, but it is a decision for years, for decades to come. And I'm glad that Secretary Carter shared my thinking and that our two governments, our two states are uh, aware of the strategic significance of these decisions. Thank you, uh, Igor Dunayevsky, a reporter for a Russian newspaper. 
Uh, President of uh, European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, in recent months uh, called for creation of uh, European Armed Forces. So my question is, uh, do you support this idea and um, are there any practical consultations between European uh, defense ministries? And how would uh, broadly that uh, fit uh, in a European security um, system where NATO till the moment was the main element? Thank you. European defense ministers naturally support all the ideas uh, that support European defense capabilities. That idea of uh, President Juncker is not new. I mentioned that uh, in my address. And we took it as a good incentive for our further discussion and making everyone aware that if we were to sum up the budgets and number of troops in individual nations, we would have the second largest uh, army of the world in Europe after the United States. But since the effort is scattered, then when we sum up uh, the defense capabilities of individual nations, we get a much lower figure. Uh, this is how I responded to the question what we expected from the June uh, European Council on Defense. We believe that it is a far-reaching plan and it is good to talk about specifics, about specific tangible things we can do, we can get, and uh, something that is already on the table. The European Army is a very tough project for a variety of reasons. And I, to tell you the truth, do not know whether it would be simply a, a, a redundancy, duplication of what NATO already has with its military structure, the preparation for uh, taking up different operations that has already been tested in Kosovo, in Afghanistan, in many uh, different operations in, and exercises. So I believe that what President Juncker is saying is a great intellectual provocation so that Europeans could talk more about defense with each other. However, I guess that very much time will have to pass before that plan has any tangible outcome. Mr. Minister, you have answered a lot of tough questions this afternoon. Thank you so much. I know you have some meetings uh, with uh, members of Congress that you are going to need to uh, get to. So we're going to have to finish our conversation. But thank you, uh, audience. Those were really tough and good questions. Mr. Minister, thank you. Thank you for being such a stalwart of the US-Polish relationship, but also of a very strong NATO and a, and a very uncertain picture for Europe's security. We are delighted with our partnership. Look forward to more conversation about the 